So what I'm going to do is kind of give you an overview of uh, NERSC today and then talk about kind of what are our plans for the, uh, uh, the next 10 years. So NERSC's mission is to accelerate scientific discovery at the DOE Office of Science. Uh, uh, and so that's important to note, it is at the Office of Science. We do have collaborations that are broader, but our primary mission is serving the needs of Office of Science. And it's through high performance computing and extreme data analysis. And we're seeing, as Kathy mentioned, kind of a growing <coughs> importance of data at NERSC. And I'll be talking about that uh, in, in, throughout the talk. So as I mentioned, uh, NERSC is unusual in that we do have a long history. There are, more, uh, uh, there are other DOE computing facilities that are, that are uh, more, more recent, but NERSC was established back in 1974. It's 1996 that, that NERSC moved to Berkeley Lab. And I think what's notable is that the, a number of things recently you know, uh, have really focused on data. So we, we're going to continue to focus on computing, um, uh, you know, computing at scale and the high throughput computing that Kathy mentioned. But a number of the things that have really been kind of notable have had to do with data. One is we established the PDSF uh, data intensive computing system for uh, nuclear and high energy physics. Uh, and that continues to be upgraded and, and has had a, uh, and continues on to today, and that's had a, uh, a notable impact on those communities. Uh, HPSS became the mass storage platform in 1999. Uh, so uh, we established a facility-wide file system in 2005, uh, and then we uh, had a, started our collaboration with uh, the Joint Genome Institute to provide all their computing back in 2010. So, so a number of these have really had to do with, with uh, kind of our growing mission and data. So in terms of NERSC today, I was really going to kind of focus on kind of what's different about NERSC than some of the other computing facilities, because you all know about Oak Ridge and Argonne as well. And so, uh, but we are quite, quite different from them in a number of important ways. Uh, we, we do also, you know, uh, uh, work with computer companies in, uh, to deploy advanced HPC and data resources. So we deploy a wide range of different types of systems uh, uh, that are first of the kind and push the state of the art in terms of technology in different ways. Uh, we deployed Hopper, which is the first, uh, one of the first Cray petascale systems with a new Gemini interconnect. Uh, uh, we're currently deploying Edison, which will be the first Cray petascale system with Intel processors and an Ares interconnect and a Dragonfly topology. And, and Edison is, uh, uh, there's a, four cabinets are on, on the floor now, and, and we'll be moving to general avail, uh, availability for that. Uh, 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 it's uh, the DARPA serial number one system that we have on the floor right now. Uh, we're developing NERSC-8 uh, in collaboration with ACES, and those will be designed as uh, on-ramps to exascale. Uh, and we've architected and deployed data platforms, including the largest DOE systems focused on genomics. And, and we, as I said, we had one of the first facility-wide file systems. Uh, you know, we employ experts in high-performance computing, computer systems engineering, data storage, and networking. So one thing that's different from, for us is that we directly support DOE science mission. So we're the primary computing facility for DOE Office of Science. So we do allocate about 10% of the resources ourselves, but most of the allocations at NERSC are really done by uh, Office of Science. So six program offices allocate their base allocations, and then when we uh, put a new system on the floor, uh, they can submit proposals to over, for over targets. Uh, and the deputy director of science prioritizes those over target requests. So, so it's really a, 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 you know, serving the, the, the needs of DOE Office of Science. Uh, up there is showing kind of the breakdown among the different offices. Uh, and the other thing is that the usage shifts as DOE priorities change. And so what we notice is that material science, for instance, has gone up in the last 10 years, biosciences, earth sciences, uh, combustion engineering, and so there has been kind of this move within the Department of Energy from science, uh, uh, so they're still doing fundamental science, but there's been kind of a growing emphasis on science that has an application, and we see that reflected in terms of the uh, uh, allocations at NERSC. Uh, we really are focused on the scientific impact of our users. Uh, uh, 
There are about 1,500 uh, journal publications per year, about 10 journal cover stories per year on average. There were 13 in 2012. Uh, there have been a number of notable uh, accomplishments using NERSC resources. It, uh, simulations at NERSC were key to two Nobel Prizes in 2007 and 2011. Uh, uh, data uh, resources and services played an important role in two of Science Magazine's top ten breakthroughs of 2012. Uh, Smithsonian Magazine's fifth surprising scientific milestone of 2012, uh, four of Science Magazine's insights of the last decade. Uh, the other thing to, to note here is that a number of these have really, uh, in, in addition to uh, simulation, have involved data. And so uh, 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 both of the, the, uh, the discovery of the Higgs bo boson and the measurement of the, uh, the theta-1-3 neutrino, neutrino weak mixing angle, those were both uh, focused on data. Uh, uh, the three genomics ones that are uh, at the bottom, those were focused on data. Uh, uh, there's a supernova that was caught within hours of an explosion in 2011. Uh, that was data that was transferred from a telescope to, uh, to uh, the NERSC systems and analyzed. And telescopes from around the world were redirected the same night. So, so we are seeing this shift that Kathy had mentioned. The other thing that's really different for, for us is that we support a very broad user base. So we have 4,500 users, and we typically add uh, 350 users per year. Uh, uh, so it's geographically distrib uh, distributed. We have 47 states. We have multinational projects, so we have users around the world. Um, uh, we have 10 states with... Uh, over 100 users, and we have 13 with uh, 50, to, uh, 50 to 99 users. I always tell my story as I was on a Southwest flight, and uh, I had up my hopper shirt, and I hadn't shaved, and I had my tattered uh, jeans on, and someone came up to me and said, do you work at NERSC? And, and so, so we have users, uh, apparently, on all, uh, if you get on a plane, you're likely to run into a NERSC user. So we support a very diverse workload. You know, we have many codes, over 600 codes and algorithms. And so again, this is you know the uh, the Oak Ridge and Argon. They focus on on uh, you know a dozen or a few dozens of users, and they have you know maybe uh, a dozen code teams and and codes that they worry about. We have 600 codes and algorithms, and and we really, in terms of algorithms, we have all kinds of different things, ranging from fusion fusion to uh, uh, density function functional theory, to climate, to MD, lattice QCD. So, so we have to serve the very broad needs of this community. Uh, we also have people running at all kinds of different scales, as Kathy mentioned. We have people running. Uh, this is showing the so job size breakdown on Hopper, and, and it has about 153,000 cores. So in red are jobs that use over 65,000 cores. And so you see that we have lots of people using uh, 65,000 cores and over, over 15,000 cores. And then we have lots of smaller simulations where really very high volumes of smaller simulations. Uh, so we have to be able to support this very diverse workload. So we really have an operational priority, which is providing highly available HPC resources backed by exceptional user support. Uh, so so uh, we try to maintain a very high availability of our resources. So we always have one large HPC system available at all times. So we try to have two systems on the floor, uh, uh, if at all possible, because it takes usually several months to get one of these systems stabilized. And so, so you know, right now, both uh, Argonne and Oak Ridge have been upgrading their, their, uh, their systems, and they've not been available for, for, uh, for uh, a period of time. And so at NERSC, we don't do that. Uh, we can't do that, given our mission and our uh, in our uh, user base. Uh, our goal is really to maximize the productivity of our users. So we provide one-on-one -on -one consulting. Uh, this shows uh, the number of tickets over time. So this is uh, essentially we deal with this with constant staff over the last 10 years. And so 10 years ago, we were seeing about 3.4 tickets per user. Our goal is to solve eight, uh, have a path for solving 80% of user tickets within three, three business days. Uh, but you can see that there are thousands of tickets that are generated. And, and, and so right now, we're at about 1.2 tickets per user. And so it's really critical for us to develop kind of scalable methods 
to deal with this in that, in that we really try to use uh, extensive use of web pages, putting information for you all online, uh, training, uh, you know, people understand that if you can do things that reach a broad segment of this user base that it'll help us keep the number of tickets down per user and so that's really critical. So I guess uh, uh, in terms of the future, uh, uh, needs and challenges, so we've been asked by DOE to do a st uh, strategic planning, so we've been busy doing that for uh, several months and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that and what we project is the future needs and challenges and then kind of our strategy. So, uh, so Richard and, uh, and Harvey Wasserman, they do these uh, requirements reviews with six program offices. So there are reviews with every three years with each office and a number of you have probably attended some of those. But the program managers uh, invite representative set of users, typically we try to get more than 50% of the usage from that office represented at these meetings. Uh, 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 with uh, BES, that's harder because it's a very large community. At H, at uh, HEP, we had about 85% of the usage represented at the last uh, meeting. Uh, uh, Richard and Harvey work hard to uh, have them identify the, their science goals and representative use cases. Uh, and based on those use cases, it, they try to uh, back out what the uh, requirements are. And then they rescale the estimates to account for users that are not at the meeting. And, and, and then we aggregate the results across the six uh, offices and then we try to validate uh, from other sources including, uh, including what we hear from this meeting. This tends to underestimate the need because we're missing future users. So, so uh, but if we uh, project out, so the, uh, the black line there is the trend, the historical NERSC trend over time of of computing that's, uh, that's available to the users. This is normalized in terms of hopper, which is 1.3 petaflops. So, so one there is, uh, is one hopper year. And this just shows over time, it's been a pretty, pretty linearly, we've been going up pretty linearly uh, uh, at, on this logarithmic scale. And, and shown in red are the actual uh, hours delivered. And if you, uh, uh, Right now, we're, when we deploy uh, uh, Edison, this is where we're going to be with Hopper and Edison. And so what's going on is that, that in terms of kind of the, the general pur purpose x86 processors, it's going to get harder and harder to stay on this trend line uh, with those kinds of processors. And so we made the strategic decision with Edison uh, to make it an x86-based system because the users really weren't in general, ready for GPUs or, or accelerators. But you can see that if we continue that, we would fall below the, the kind of the historical trend line. Uh, so with NERSC-8, we're really looking at uh, some kind of system that has a more energy efficient architecture that would let us get back closer to the trend. And we have kind of a, uh, a range here that depends on the budget. And so, so if we're at the higher end of the budget, we'll be able to get back on the trend line. So, of course, the important thing is really what do the users need? And it turns out that the users need a lot more than that. And so this is kind of the aggregation from the requirements reviews. Uh, and you can see that the, the, the need is actually much higher. And this is a logarithmic scale. The need is actually much higher. The other thing that you'll notice is that if we just project this out, the, uh, the aggregate need of the six uh, program offices at NERSC would su surpass exascale in about 2018. And so in that time frame, people need to be able to run simulations that are hundreds of petaflops or thousands of millions of simulations that are a petaflop. Uh, but in aggregate, that'll, be, that's well, that'll, uh, that'll reach exascale in about, in about uh, 2018. So if you see this, if you plot this, uh, I was asking Richard, well, you know, on a log logarithmic scale, you don't quite see it. Uh, the, as much, but if we plot it on a, uh, a linear scale, you can see that in the NERSC-8 time frame, that if we were on the lower end here, it would be over a factor of five less than the, uh, uh, what's been identified as the, uh, the, the, the science needs of the different offices. So we've also asked the users about storage and, and uh, uh, aggregated those needs. And, and in terms of 2014, um, if we went along our historical trend line, would be about 30 petabytes short and uh, in, in 2014 and in 2017 would be 245 petabytes short. 
The other thing we've been looking at is the, uh, the data traffic uh, into and out of NERSC. And that's also following a uh, linear, uh, it's going up linearly on this logarithmic plot. Uh, and there are a couple of notable things. One is you see this, this slight drop here, but that was really because of uh, some improvements in software and TCP auto-tuning. But then you saw this jump as we started to see more uh, traffic. This is really from, uh, from high energy physics. Uh, but you could imagine that, um, uh, and this doesn't count the JGI traffic, and so there'd be another step if you, we were to plot that. Uh, so every time we engage a facility, we're really going to end up uh, uh, seeing these jumps up above what we're seeing as kind of the trend line. And what we're expecting to see is uh, we'd see our first petabyte day in 2020. So that's really an amazing amount of data that's being moved. So I get asked what, what surprised you the most. And so this is really what surprised me the most uh, since I've taken over, uh, over NERSC is that NERSC users import more data than they export. And so uh, when you're, you're running a supercomputing center, you would, your traditional model is people do simulations and then take data away. What people are doing is well, they are doing that. They're, they're, they're transferring away lots of data, and we've gone up to a petabyte per month uh, in terms of data traffic out. But for the last four years, we've actually seen more data coming in. And so a number of times, we've seen more than a petabyte per month. And so this, this plot includes JGI, whereas the previous one didn't. Uh, but we're seeing really staggering amounts of data coming into NERSC. And, and so this is really... A lot of this is experimental data or sequencing data, and people are bringing it to NERSC to, to do those uh, analysis uh, uh, that I was showing earlier. The other thing we're seeing in these uh, uh, requirements reviews is that there's an uh, increasing emphasis on data. In all the uh, uh, reviews that Richard and Harvey have had, uh, they've pulled out uh, various statements, but, but we, we see kind of the... Uh, the greater need for, for, for storage, for analytics, for archival uh, storage, for uh, sharing data, curation. Uh, so, so we're seeing that kind of across the board. And we're also uh, collaborating with more ex DOE experimental facilities, and they're facing uh, you know, kind of a similar set of da extreme data challenges as uh, our, our computing folks are facing. And, and basically what's going on is if you look at kind of the improvement per year, this is in memory, this is in processors, and this is in instruments. So things like sequencers and uh, detectors. What you're seeing is we're, we're used to thinking that processors are on this Moore's Law curve, and that's really uh, uh, a very fast rate of improvement. But things that are instruments are improving at a much faster rate than, than Moore's Law. And, and if you look at things like cost per genome, uh, it's dropping much faster than Moore's Law. And if we look at uh, expected data rate production from things like light sources, what we're seeing is that they're, they're going to get up to uh, terabits per second uh, uh, in the next five to ten years. And so, so when we were talking to the light sources, you know, they were kind of projecting their, their, uh, their data needs. You know, they're at about 65 terabytes per year now, and they were projecting, or in 2009, they were expecting to go about 1.9 petabytes per year in 2013. And if you just extrapolate this out, uh, trend line out, they'd be out to, up to exabytes in 2021. And there are other, other communities that we deal with where, you know, they're, they're going to be generating hundreds of petabytes of data that they need to, uh, they need to analyze. And what they're seeing is that in a lot of cases that you really can't, analyze all the data, and you really can't compare across data sets. And a lot of scientific discovery is really from comparing across data sets. And they have very limited ability to be able to do that right now. And I won't spend as much time on this, but, but you know, as Kathy was pointing out, you know, the computer industry roadmaps uh, are not going to meet the, the mission needs that we're seeing here. Uh, there's kind of uh, great challenges with the technology as we go forward. Uh, there's lots of uh, uh, possibilities for improvement. So what I'm showing here is ASCII Red. So this was the first teraflops uh, supercomputer that we deployed at Sandia, and this is a Intel teraflops chip. So so this is uh, in in practice this would be the same amount of computing as this, uh, but but uh, but when you actually try to program this and, and you look at the amount of memory that's available and and the memory bandwidth, uh, it's going to be a real challenge to get the scientific productivity out of this that you got out of this. 
And so we really need to meet these challenges uh, uh, through hardware and software. So we're going to need to rewrite some of the codes, uh, but we're also going to need to influence the computer industry. So, so if Kathy's talking about computing on things like this, you know, uh, they really don't care about uh, uh, reliability as much, right? And if, if once in a while you have a failure, you may not care as much. They also may not care about correctness, right? You're, you're very worried that, that when you're done with your computation that you can trust the result. But, but if we're counting on things that are in cell phones, uh, if you drop a bit every now and then, they really don't care, right? And so, so we really need to be able to somehow influence the computer industry uh, to meet, uh, meet, our, uh, meet our needs in terms of uh, reliability and, 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 uh, and correctness. And so what I'm showing here is that, you know, we've been on this trend line, which has been, as Kathy was showing, has been exponentially uh, increasing improvements, but we're really beginning to see this, this fall off in, in terms of what people are actually achieving on these systems uh, is not keeping up with what the, uh, you know, what the, uh, uh, the, the, the peak or the LINPAC numbers that we're seeing. So, so I did want to point out that, that these challenges really aren't impacting just exascale, as Kathy mentioned. It's really all scales of computing that are, that are going to be impacted here. To, so in terms of our strategy, what we've been looking at is, you know, we want to be able to meet these ever-growing computing and data needs. Uh, so we need to provide usable exascale computing and storage systems. Uh, we're starting now uh, to work with a number of users to begin transitioning the codes to execute effectively on many core arch architectures. I know a number of you have been working on this already, but we uh, are, are, are planning to engage our community uh, 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 more in the next several years as we begin preparing for NurseGate. Uh, and the other thing we're doing is we're really looking at how can we influence the computer industry to ensure that some of these systems can meet the, the mission and science needs of the Office of Science. And our secondary objective is to increase the productivity, usability, and impact of DOE user facilities uh, by, by providing comprehensive data systems. And it's not just hardware, but it's also uh, software and services that, that are needed to be able to do this. Uh, so Kathy already mentioned the, the, the new facility. Uh, uh, this is critical, deploying this facility. Uh, uh, in terms of being able to provide both the power and, and the space that's needed. Uh, so this was just a shot that's taken, uh, so just down the hill, but the retaining wall is in place, and, and, uh, and the, so the foundation is being completed, and so in, within the next couple of months, the foundation will be completed, and, and they'll start uh, working on the structure. So our, the plan is to, uh, to, uh, to move in uh, early 2015, so, so first quarter of 2015. So in terms of those different, different uh, objectives that I mentioned, uh, providing, the first was providing usable exascale computing and storage systems. Uh, as I mentioned, we made NERSC 7 a x86-based system. Uh, uh, but in terms of NERSC 8, that will be our first pre-exascale system. We'll have a pre-exascale system in 2019, NERSC 9, and a, an exascale system in 2023. So our strategy is that, that this is... Uh, pretty much what we've been doing in the past, but it's really having open competition for the best solution. So we don't pick which systems we're going to buy. We really look for a, uh, a competition to see what people propose and try to pick the best of those. We focus on the performance of a broad range of applications and not just benchmarks. So our goal is not to, to build the best LINPAC machine, but it's really to, to build a, a system that works on a broad range of applications. Because of the diversity in the, the, the codes and the algorithms, we really need general purpose architectures. So what's, what's new is that we want to do earlier procurement so we can have a greater influence on the design. There are these DOE fast forward and design forward efforts that I'm very involved with. These are collaborations with processor and memory companies. These are going to be with system uh, integrators and with, uh, with interconnect companies. Uh, but, but we're working very closely with them so that the research that they're doing uh, benefits uh, DOE applications. There's a lot of work going on in co-design, and we're planning on leveraging that as well. And then we really need to begin this transition to a new programming model. So in terms of programming models, our, our near-term strategy is, is to hopefully provide you some kind of smooth progression to exascale. 
Uh, we want to provide support for legacy code, although that's going to be at less than optimal performance. And would like to be able to get reasonable performance with MPI plus OpenMP, at least in the near term. NurseGate will support other programming models, and we're really not pre-selecting those. That's going to be based on, based on the procurement that we're doing. And we're going to support optimized libraries so that hopefully uh, people can get some of the performance by just by just using uh, libraries that are highly tuned or optimized for these systems. Longer term, we really need to, to, to have uh, a, a, a broader effort to converge on the next programming model. And, and, and that's something that we're also looking at is how can we drive this so that, that it's not just, this is probably more evolutionary, but we want to leave room for something that's revolutionary and much better. I mean, in some sense, we are very focused on performance, improving the performance of our codes on next generation architectures, but programmability is really uh, critical as well, as we don't want systems that are, that are uh, next to impossible to program. So in terms of transitioning the codes, uh, uh, so we're beginning to deploy test beds, so there are a number of test beds at NERSC um, to help you and with us gain experience with new technologies and to better understand some of the trade-offs. Uh, we're going to have in-depth collaborations with some selected users. Uh, we're trying to cover that algorithm space, so, so we want to make sure that we have some, uh, cover that as broadly as we can, and, and, be, and we want to begin transitioning some of the codes. And so this will really be based on how much usage do they represent, how much diversity in the algorithms is there, uh, and then uh, kind of what's the level of interest by those users in making this transition. And so based on that, we're going to develop uh, and, and other uh, efforts in the community, we're going to develop training and online resources to help uh, kind of the rest of our com users as well. And we will have consultants available to help with, with, uh, uh, with in-depth questions and, and issues. So, so I think it's really critical to note again that, that all the users will be impacted. And so, so when I get asked, well, what fraction of the codes eventually need to make this transition out of those 600? I think eventually all of those codes have to, because otherwise you're going to be stuck at today's performance levels. I mean, you're not going to see this Moore's Law improvement in your codes unless you're uh, uh, able to make this leap to next generation uh, uh, architectures. So, so as I mentioned, we also want to influence industry more. We want to make sure that these future systems meet our needs and, and are more programmable and reliable. Part of that, we're partnering with Los Alamos and Sandia on our procurements in 2015 and 2019. So we're already seeing that the larger size of these procurements is giving us more leverage, more interest. We had uh, uh, 10 different companies respond to our draft RFP. Uh, we want to provide industry with greater information on our workload. Uh, uh, there are all these co-design efforts, but in some sense, the the uh, people like Intel and NVIDIA are really going to be more influenced by uh, what does the overall workload look like rather than just one particular application. And so, so those co-design efforts are important, but we also need to be, provide them uh, uh, kind of broader information uh, through things like instrumentation and measurement. Um, as I mentioned, we're already a actively engaging with Fast Forward and Design Forward. Uh, we have this computer architecture lab that's been established by Oscar that's a Berkeley-Sandia collaboration. And we want to serve as this conduit for information flow between computer companies and our user community. Uh, in terms of our extreme data strategy, we're partnering with DOE experimental facilities uh, to identify some of the requirements and create some early successes. We're developing and uh, uh, deploying new data resources already, but our plans are, are to to deploy uh, systems that are really focused on data in the in-between years. So in 2017 and 2021, we would deploy uh, systems that are really focused on data, uh, data analysis. Uh, uh, we want to provide a new class of HPC expertise. What we'd like to do is be, uh, enable people to rely on NERSC uh, for data analysis the same way they do currently for, for computation. And, and we really have a unique opportunity here uh, with ESNet and, and, and uh, all the OSCAR research that's funded uh, to create some end-to-end -end solutions in this space. So, so, so we do believe that as of now, we do provide unique data-centric resources. Examples of that are Genepool and PDSF and Carver. 
um, uh, we think that's going to continue on into the future. And so, so we will have these compute intensive architectures that are really, the, the goal is to maximize the computational density and local bandwidth for a given power cost constraint. And so we're going to try to, you know, those try to maximize the bandwidth density near compute. For data intensive architectures, your goal is really to, to get the maximum data capacity and global bandwidth for a given power cost constraint. And so you want to bring sto more storage near compute or conversely embed more compute near the, st the storage. And this also requires a lot different software and programming environments. So people are interested in running databases, for instance. So if you look at the building blocks that are underneath all of this, they're, they're very similar, but how you organize them into a system is much different. And so, so as we go forward, this kind of just summarizes what, we're, we're, what our current plan is, that we would be deploying NERSC 8 in, in late 2015, NERSC 9 in 2019, and NERSC 10 in 2023. And then we'd have the NERSC Data 1 system, which would be uh, kind of the follow-on, kind of the natural follow-on to the, uh, the data systems that we currently have deployed in 2017 and, and uh, 2020, uh, 2021. And so in blue, what I'm showing is kind of the, uh, the, the need that's been identified in the, uh, in the various requirements meetings, the aggregate need. The yellow line is uh, the historical trend line for NERSC. Uh, uh, this light blue would be if we're kind of limited by our, our current budget and power. In red would be if we're limited by budget, so it's, it's more uh, what's the largest system that we could buy for a certain amount of money. And in green is if we're, if we're limited by power. And Oscar has told us that, that we should plan, each of the, the, the computing centers should plan for a maximum of 30 megawatts. And so we'd be reaching 30 megawatts out here. And so this would be uh, kind of the trend line. So kind of the bottom line here is really if we want to get anywhere near what the users have told us that they need, uh, we really need to be much more aggressive in terms of uh, deploying some of the, the hardware that's uh, projected for, for exascale systems. And so we really need to have some active research with, uh, with industry to try to push, push this curve up. Because in principle, you know, we're, we're never, uh, for environmental reasons and for, for just cost, uh, it's very unlikely that anyone's ever going to want to deploy more than 30 megawatts of computing. And so, so so being st even staying at that, which is a lot, we're going to be well short. And so, so I'll just uh, close with saying that uh, you know we do have a strategy and a plan for meeting uh, uh, the kind of the ever-growing uh, computing and storage needs that we've identified with the community, and we really want to enable the science teams with the nation's largest data-intensive challenges to rely on NERSC to the same degree they already do for modeling and simulation. So I'll close with that. Hopefully, that gave you some some ideas of where we're headed.